Catherine Nichols prefers to remember her brother for who he was. Jim Duckett loved horses, and in his younger years, loved doing impersonations. Catherine says he was an amazing uncle to her children, but a thorn in her side as well, just like most younger siblings. He was also a great listener, but Catherine tries to forget the final memory that she has of her brother. When investigators found him tied to a chair in his bathroom, after being subjected to hours of real-life horror unlike anything you could ever imagine. Though he may give the impression of being a calm, quiet man who would never harm a fly, Jim Duckett actually had a history that was, in all honesty, pretty surprising. Contrary to his outward appearance, Jim was a military veteran who received multiple decorations for his time serving for the United States. He was in active duty during the Desert Storm operations, but he was eventually forced to retire after he suffered an injury that made him no longer able to serve. He managed to recover from this for the most part, but his life was never truly the same. He eventually relocated to Germany of all places and became a crime scene investigator. Quite the change in career paths, but Jim was more than up to the task. After a few years, he decided that he was ready to return home to the United States. His main reason for doing this was to spend more time with his sister and her children. He learned that his sister was having a difficult time taking care of her kids because of her increasingly stressful work schedule. So he dropped everything he was doing and came back home to make sure that the children were raised properly and had a fair shot at a normal childhood. This led him to Shelbyville, Kentucky. He would later adopt a rescue dog named Bo, and it seemed like Jim and Bo went everywhere together. According to Catherine Nichols, Jim's sister, he was one of the kindest people that she had ever known, and his actions and history certainly seemed to prove this. While Jim lived a fairly open and honest life, his sister says that in the months leading up to that fateful day, he became a bit withdrawn and he'd begun acting strange. His personality seemed to have shifted a bit, turning this once outgoing and life-loving man into somewhat of a hermit, seemingly paranoid about the world around him. This began in the fall of 2008. On Halloween of that same year, someone broke into Jim's house and ransacked the place. We don't know if he was home at the time, but considering he was a military veteran, it's probably safe to assume that he wasn't or the perpetrators likely would have been caught or never made it out of the home alive, but neither of these things are true. The unknown criminals ended up making off with thousands of dollars of jewelry that Jim had lying around, and it doesn't seem like the police ever caught the thieves that were responsible. All of this only made Jim's paranoia worse, and his personality and kind nature only continued to dwindle from here. In fact, for several weeks leading up to this, Jim had discussed how he'd been thinking about moving. His sudden interest in changing towns was extremely odd. After all, he'd moved back to the US to be closer to his family. So what could possibly make him want to uproot once again and leave his family behind? By November 9th of 2008, Catherine had become suspicious about her brother and feared that something may have been terribly wrong. The two spoke every single day of their lives, but on this day, Jim had seemingly gone missing, vanished without so much as a call, a text, or a note. We don't know if it had been days or hours, but it was long enough that Catherine began to fear for his safety. It was unlike him to stay out of touch with everyone for such a long period of time, and no one had seen him leave his house in days. This was all taking place on a Sunday morning. Jim was a churchgoer, so Catherine decided to call a few of his friends at church, but all of them reported that he didn't show up for services that morning. For Catherine, this was the final straw. She headed out to his house to make sure that everything was okay. When she arrived at his house, she immediately noticed that his car wasn't in the driveway, which was yet another odd occurrence, as he didn't mention traveling or having any errands to run, and Catherine and Jim shared every detail of their lives up to this point. Catherine says that she walked all around his house that evening, but she didn't see anything out of the ordinary. There were no signs of a second break-in, nor any reason to believe that anything was wrong. She knocked, but there was no answer. She mentioned that she had a key to his house, but she decided not to go in because she didn't want her brother thinking that she didn't trust him or to barge in on him if he just wanted time to be left alone. She left a few minutes later confused and baffled by what was going on but she could have never guessed what lied just beyond his front door.
By the following day, Catherine had enough. She was still unable to get a hold of her brother, so she went back to his house to look around once again. This time, she decided enough was enough, and she went into his home to see if she could find any clues about what was going on. She made her way through his house, into the master bedroom, and eventually into the master bathroom. This was when she made the discovery that would haunt her for the rest of her life. She found her brother, but not in the way that she had hoped. When speaking with a local news organization, she mentioned how she remembered Jim's bathroom being white from ceiling to floor. White tile, white walls, a white shower, everything. But on this particular day, there was no white to be found, only red. She began to scream and immediately called her sister. She began shouting that someone had taken Jim's life, but her sister asked if it was possible that he had taken his own life. That's when Catherine noticed that Jim's hands had been tied behind his back and he'd been strapped to one of his kitchen chairs, unable to move. This certainly wasn't of Jim's own doing. Catherine got off the phone with her sister and immediately called the police. When investigators arrived, it became very clear what had happened here. Rather, as clear as it could possibly be considering the situation. Investigators agreed with the obvious assumption that Jim had been tied to a chair, beaten for hours, jabbed multiple times with various objects, and then had his life taken. Interestingly, most of Jim's wounds were considered to be superficial, meaning that they weren't inflicted with the intention of taking his life, they were merely to make him suffer. It appeared as though someone had been trying to get information out of him, but no one has any clue what kind of information Jim would have known that would be worth all of this. We also don't know if Jim ever let that information slip, but considering his background and the aftermath, it seems safe to assume that the assailants never found the answers they were looking for. But one interesting side note is that even though the criminals were remarkably cruel toward Jim, his dog was found locked in a separate room of the home, completely unharmed. Police say that they were never able to determine why all of this had happened, or specifically when. All they revealed is that Jim appeared to have been tied up in his bathroom for a couple of days at least. As investigators worked to collect evidence and clean up the crime scene, they decided to take several samples of the DNA found all around the bathroom in order to confirm whether or not all of it belonged to Jim. The details of this information are a bit difficult to understand, but from what I can gather, police were able to retrieve DNA that didn't belong to Jim, but I'm not 100% certain about this. Investigators spoke with Catherine again a few days later and said that after running a DNA analysis, they expected to have someone in custody within a matter of months. But it's now been 15 years, and officers are no closer to getting this case solved. The Duckett family was obviously desperate for answers, with many of them beginning to wonder if the crime on Halloween could have somehow been related. As far as investigators have said, the Halloween crime was totally random and the thieves only wanted to make off with valuables that Jim had around his home. But if you ask me, and this is purely a theory, it's possible that the Halloween crime could have been much more than investigators initially believed. If someone was truly after Jim and someone had been paid to track him down, the Halloween break-in could have been in an attempt to confirm that Jim was, in fact, the man that they were looking for. Just think about it, if you're hired to take someone out, or at the very least locate them, wouldn't you want to confirm that this was the right guy before taking his info back to your boss? And what better way to do this than to break into his home and find documentation to prove his identity, staging it as a robbery as you go? The timeline here is just too strange for all of this to merely be a coincidence, but again, that's just my opinion. But footage from an ATM just a few miles from Jim's house may have provided investigators with answers. Because of the way that Jim lost his life, police were obviously operating under the assumption that this was a targeted crime. Jim wasn't just a victim of a random act of violence. One of the lead detectives in the investigation has confirmed that they believe Jim was targeted, but they have no idea why. Was it because of his involvement in the military, or maybe even because of his time investigating crimes in Germany? No one can really say for sure. But police revealed an even more confusing bit of evidence that makes this case all the more strange and confusing. According to Catherine, officers told her that while the criminals were inside Jim's house, they stole his debit card. The only thing about this that's unclear is whether the first batch of criminals stole the card or the second batch stole the card, but the context here leads me to believe that it was likely the second batch that stole it, the batch that tied him to the chair. 
What's strange about this is that after the criminals had the card, they didn't just drive to the nearest ATM and drain the account. Instead, they stole Jim's truck and drove all the way out to Jim's personal bank to make the withdrawal. Mind you, according to Catherine, Jim lived out in the country, essentially in the middle of nowhere. There were dozens of banks that the criminals needed to pass up in order to make their way to Jim's personal bank. So there was clearly some significance to this location, but what that significance was is unknown. But here's the craziest part. One of the criminals was captured on CCTV at the bank. The bank's cameras were pointed directly at the criminal and were actively recording at the time of the ATM withdrawal. But the lens was messed up, so the footage proved to be useless. According to one of the bank managers, the camera had recently been taken apart for maintenance, but when it was put back together, the lens was improperly installed. This caused the footage to be extremely distorted, rendering it useless to investigators. This is yet another aspect of the case that seems just a bit too perfect to merely be a coincidence. It was almost as if the criminals knew about this specific bank and this specific camera. After all, judging by what detectives and Catherine have alluded to, the criminals didn't even try to conceal their identities in the footage. It was almost like they knew that the footage would be useless because the camera had been tampered with, or improperly maintained if you believe the official explanation. Regardless, as detectives continued to work the case, they were staying on the lookout for Jim's truck. A few days later, they managed to find it about five miles from Jim's home. They searched the truck for fingerprints and even took DNA samples, but nothing ever came of it. Investigators said that they have followed up on several leads after this and that dozens of people have been interviewed, but there just isn't much evidence to go on. Why Jim was targeted and why this specific bank was used is unknown, but if you could imagine, things continue to get even more bizarre from here. One of the most disturbing details about this case is something that doesn't seem to have made headlines or really been mentioned in any of the write-ups about Jim Duckett. In fact, it was something that Catherine let slip during an interview and it seems like most people just glossed over it. According to Catherine, Jim believed that he knew who broke into his house on Halloween. And Catherine says she believes, as I theorized a moment ago, that these individuals would have been the same ones who broke in again and took Jim's life. The only problem is that either no one is taking this accusation seriously, or the police just don't have enough evidence to secure a warrant, much less a conviction. I was only able to find one article where Catherine mentioned this, and it was only discussed for a brief moment, with no names being shared, though I imagine that was strictly for legal reasons. But the fact that this hasn't been discussed further is really concerning. Investigators say that even after all these years, police have several binders full of information about Jim and his case. The only problem is that none of this information has led to any suspects or even a motive for the crime. Catherine says that the method in which Jim lost his life has naturally led many people to believe that he was involved in some sort of underground crime ring or that he was otherwise in possession of information that he wasn't supposed to have. But Catherine rejects all of these ideas, saying that she knew her brother better than anyone and that he showed no signs of being involved in any shady dealings. She explained that she understands why people may have come to this assumption, but that her brother was simply too kind. Instead, she thinks it may have been his kindness that led to this crime. More specifically, she thinks he may have been taken out for revenge of some sort, but no one knows what this revenge would have been for, unless it was something that happened during Desert Storm or something that happened in Germany. But police have found no evidence for either of these situations to be true. At the end of it all, we just don't know what may have happened to Jem. To make matters worse, the local police force has seen dramatic budget cuts and rising resignation rates as a result, so the department is doing its best just to stay open at this point, so investigating a cold case like this is not something that's on their current to-do list. This means that, for the foreseeable future, the only realistic way of getting this case solved is by asking the public for help, asking you for help. So if you were in Shelbyville, Kentucky in November of 2008 and believe you may have seen something, anything, you're asked to contact the Kentucky State Police, Post 12, at 502-227-2221. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you want to see more cases like this, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, the best way you can do that is just by leaving a comment below. Any comment at all. 
If you'd like to help out financially, you can click that blue join button below the video or consider grabbing a True Crime Stories mug at tynots.com. But with that, my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.